All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Council Member Rafael Salamanca. I'm the chair of the Subcommittee on Planning, Dispositions, and Concessions. Uh, welcome, everyone, to today's hearing. Uh, with us today, we have Council Member uh, Andrew Cohen, uh, Council Member Mark Traeger, and Speaker Melissa Margarito. Today, we will hold three hearings. Two items on our agenda will not be heard today and will instead be laid over. Uh, those items are LU 738, uh, Kenton Flats, and LU 742, NYCHA Small Homes. The first four related items for hearings are LU 733, 734, 735, and 736, the 126th Street Bus Depot applications. EDC seeks uh, approval of a zoning map change, a zoning text amendment, and a city map change, and a future disposition of city-owned properties to facilitate the redevelopment of the 126th Street MTA Bus Depot into a mixed-use project that includes the Harlem African Burial Ground Memorial. The environmental review for this project assumes the development of 730 residential units, half of which would be affordable at 80% of the AMI and below, and 315 square feet of commercial space and 300 parking spaces. Uh, the project is located in Speaker Melissa Margarito's district in Manhattan. And so with that, I am now opening up the public hearings on LU 733, 734, 735, and 736, the 126th Street uh, depot applications and with that I'll pass it over to Madam Speaker. Thank you Mr. Chair. I want to start off by recognizing the tremendous work that's been done to get us to this moment. This project started out with an incredible vision but it takes the hard work of individuals to make it a reality. I want to acknowledge the members of the Harlem African Burial Ground Task Force, EDC, and other community stakeholders for their efforts in shaping this project in a way that affirms our collective history. The memorial seeks to right a historical injustice by recognizing that this land and the individuals that lie within are an integral part of our cultural heritage, not just for the African American community, not just for the East Harlem community, but for the entire city. But this project has a vision that is much broader than just the memorial. It seeks to commemorate our past, but also responds to the present and future needs in the community. This site will include a significant amount of housing. I know we're going to hear the presentation from EDC, uh, roughly 700 units. And we need to maximize the amount of affordable housing and make specific set-asides for those at the lower income tiers. Further, we need to ensure that this project advances the quality of life in our community, including provisions around local hiring, pedestrian safety, and streetscape improvements in an area that has extremely dangerous intersections. Finally, I want to reiterate that while an RFP has not yet been released for this project, we look forward to working with the administration to spell out the development framework as clearly as possible, including specific community benefit commitments and affordability targets to ensure the project's success. And I have to say that I know there's going to be members and we're going to hear from some of the members of the task force, but the task force, uh, which really was spearheaded by Reverend Singletary, approached my office almost 10 years ago to really talk about the importance of this burial ground which exists within uh, where this bus depot had been built and proper recognition and memorialization had to happen. At that time, 10 years ago, uh, we had talked about wanting to see the MTA decommission the bus depot, uh, and really we were laughed at at that point, or the task force was laughed at as something that would never happen. Um, we arrived at a point eight or nine years later uh, where now MTA is decommissioning this. Uh, there has been excavations. Some findings have been, uh, some, some remains have been found, and an acknowledgement that there was a burial ground here will happen uh, as, as this development happens. So there is a lot of work at the ground, and I know we're going to hear from Jeannie and others and Sharon, I think, uh, but this is an incredible effort that was completely community-driven uh, and a vision that I invested in, I personally was involved in and, and believe in, and we're going to really see something quite incredible happen here as a result of those efforts. There's a lot of work that we need to do. We're going to hear about the project. Um, the RFP has not been issued. This is kind of a strange request where we are uh, kind of looking to or the city's looking to get approval on this before even a developer has been designated. Uh, but at least we can start developing a framework of what exactly the RFP is to include so that there's very clear commitments that are defined and that the, the, developing, uh, the developers that respond to this RFP have to meet. So we're, there's a lot of conversations. Um, I definitely look forward to the presentation and a couple of questions afterwards. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, so now we have uh, two speakers that are with us today, Ms. Cecilia Kushner and Mr. Adam Marr. 
Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Speaker, for these words. And good afternoon, Chair Salamanca and subcommittee members. I'm Cecilia Kushner. I'm a senior vice president at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. And I'm pleased to speak to you today about the 126th Street African Burial Ground Memorial and Mixed Use Project. On behalf of EDC and our um, city agency partners, HPD and LPC, the Landmark Commission, I want first to say how humbled and honored we had to have been part and to be part of this very special project. Um, as you said, Madam Speaker, we are here today as a result of years of tireless research and advocacy by the, Harlem, uh, by the Harlem African Burial Ground Task Force. The task force was funded and is co-chaired by the speaker and Reverend Patricia Singletary, um, whose L.M. Dorf Reformed Church is a descendant of the original Low Dutch Reformed Church of Harlem that established the burial ground in the 17th century. Without their leadership and the hard work of their fellow task force members, um, some of whom will testify today, this essential piece of Harlem, New York City, and global history will remain in obscurity. Um, we would like to take a moment to recognize Reverend Singletary, who is not with us today, um, but her inspiring dedication and vision for the site really allows us to move forward with this project. Um, and we would also like to thank uh, the speaker staff, in particular George Sakisian and Melinda uh, Velez, for being tremendous partners without this effort. Um, in, in 2015, when it became clear that the MTA will vacate the bus depot site and return it to the city, EDC was asked to take on the task of advancing this project from planning and public approvals through development and implementation. This project represents a unique opportunity to understand the honor, the past of the community by creating a permanent Harlem African Burial Ground Memorial that will be, in the words of the task force, a visionary memorial that empowers and educates all of the continued local, national, and global struggles for social and economic justice and spiritual fulfillment. Because of the site size, which comprises an entire block, we also have the opportunity to deliver on East Harlem most pressing needs of today as well as of tomorrow, including affordable housing, which will maximize on the site as well as jobs. The proposed land use action that are before you today facilitate these goals. In balancing these two goals, honoring the past while delivering presence and future need, we've been very mindful of ensuring that this project is financially sustainable in the long term and can really fulfill the needs of the, op the long term operation of the memorial. Um, to that end, the city's commitment is to deliver a project that on not only builds the memorial, but also generates a permanent source of revenue to keep it going over time, which is a really difficult um, goal to accomplish for cultural organization. Um, so thank you for your attention. I'm going to let my colleague Adam Moore will go through the detail of the presentation, and then we'll look forward to answer your questions. Thank you. I'm going to give a brief presentation on the project, starting with uh, just getting us all oriented. The project site, the bus depot site, is located in the northeast part of East Harlem, uh, bounded by 2nd Avenue, 1st Avenue, 126th and 127th streets, uh, adjacent to the Harlem River Drive, the RFK Bridge, and near the waterfront. Uh, it occupies an entire city block, an area of around 116,000 square feet. It is a city-owned site, and it is currently zoned for low-density manufacturing uses. Residential uses are not permitted on the site today. Uh, and here are some images uh, of what the site looks like today. Uh, it's indicated in the red there in that aerial photo, and you can see in the bottom photos the existing bus depot uh, building, which is a two-story building currently vacant. Uh, today there really is no visible outward sign of the history of this site uh, today. Right. Yeah, that's right. Thanks for, po thanks for pointing that out, Madam Speaker. That yellow sort of shape, which you can see is located at the eastern end of the site, that is the former historical uh, boundary of the African burial ground. It's an area of about 18,000 square feet. Uh, so just a word about the Harlem African Burial Ground Task Force, uh, without whose work we really wouldn't be here today. Uh, Sharon Wilkins, uh, who is the Manhattan Deputy Borough Historian, will speak uh, and can talk in much more detail about the uh, rich history of this site. Uh, but just first about the task force. Uh, it was founded uh, and is co-chaired by the speaker and Reverend Singletary uh, back in 2009. Its core mission is to promote, protect, and reclaim the history of the burial ground. Uh, in 2011, Community Board 11 actually designated the task force 
as the organization representing the interest of the historic cemetery. Uh, you can see in the bottom image here, uh, again, shows that same shape that was the historic boundaries of the burial ground. And you can see sort of what it looked like in the village of Harlem prior to the imposition of the Manhattan grid and at a time when the shoreline of the Harlem River was actually much closer to the site than it is today. Uh, the burial ground was established in the 1660s, early in the history of Harlem, uh, and it was disturbed and displaced in the mid-19th century uh, following a series of land transactions during a time when the grid was being built and the shoreline of the Harlem River was being expanded. So the uh, goals for the future memorial, which is really the centerpiece of this project, uh, and first and foremost, its goal. Uh, as articulated by the Burial Ground Task Force, the core vision for this living memorial is that it be iconic and timeless, that it evoke the historical significance and impact through education and empowerment, and that it foster a sacred sense of place. Um, as Cecilia mentioned, there has been um, a lot of archeological research and work that has taken place over the years, going back uh, over a decade to first establish uh, that there had been a burial ground located on this site. Uh, more recently, when EDC came into the project, one of the first things that we did was to hire professional archaeologists from AKRF to, con to conduct actual archaeological survey work on the site. And that was done under protocols specified by the city's Landmark Preservation Commission, as well as the State Historic Preservation Office. It was also done in close partnership and consultation with the Burial Ground Task Force. Uh, that work um, found uh, that there are, no, there are not at the present day any intact burials remaining uh, on the project site. Uh, it did discover the remains of uh, the disarticulated or partial remains of several people. Um, you can see in the photo here on the right a ceremony that was held at the bus depot presided over by Reverend Singletary to consecrate those remains. It is the intention of the task force that they be preserved and interred uh, in the future memorial. And finally, uh, there is a very significant and robust component of ongoing outreach and public education, again, spearheaded and led by the Burial Ground Task Force. Um, Sharon can speak to that in more detail, but some of those activities have included a public open house that we held in September of last year that attracted uh, over 100 people. Uh, as well as the display of informational boards that the task force has made at St. Michael's Church and in other locations. Uh, we're actually quite proud of the fact that the project team was uh, given the Mark E. Mac uh, Award for Community Engagement by the American Society of Archaeologists. Uh, that mission of education continues, and I would encourage everyone who's interested to visit the task force's website, which is habgtaskforce.org. They have some really amazing uh, information about the living history of the site. It's really worth taking a look at. Uh, so again, this has been uh, a very robust process, some photos from the open house on the right. Uh, there is another task force that was brought together by the speaker. Uh, called the 126th Street Bus Depot Task Force. And the mandate of that group is re has really been um, to look at the entire site and to lay out goals for the future redevelopment. Um, the Bus Depot Task Force includes members of Community Board 11, uh, local East Harlem groups like Strive, Operation Fight Back, and Civitas, as well as the Harlem African Burial Ground Task Force, city agencies, uh, and other interested stakeholders. And they really enumerated four key goals that continue to guide this uh, redevelopment project and will inform the future RFP. Those are to first and foremost establish a permanent memorial to the burial ground with an accompanying cultural education center that can carry on this mission of education and empowerment. Uh, secondly, to develop uh, residential uses, uh, a mix of uh, mixed income affordable housing on the site. Uh, as well as job creating commercial uses uh, to, ex to enhance the streetscape, pedestrian connections, and really reconnect this site to the surrounding neighborhood. And finally, to make sure that all of this is accomplished in a financially feasible project that can be implemented and that can support the activities of the memorial uh, going forward over the long term. 
So to speak in a little bit more detail about the proposed development program, again, uh, first and foremost component of this project is a permanent outdoor memorial that will be located on that historic footprint, uh, an area of about 18,000 square feet that will be unbuilt, will be a memorial uh, open to the public uh, in perpetuity. Uh, in addition, the cultural education center that I mentioned, which will be indoors. Uh, in terms of housing, uh, the core objective in terms of the housing part of this project, as uh, Cecilia mentioned, is to maximize affordable housing, uh, including housing for low-income and very low-income families. Um, we see potential for around 730 units of housing on this site. Uh, the city has made a commitment um, responding to a request from the speaker and from the community um, to include a sizable component of very deep affordable housing, specifically that at least 20% of the units in this project will be affordable uh, to families earning at or below 30% of area median income. Um, in East Harlem, uh, median household income is around $24,500 for a family of uh, three, uh, sorry, 30%. Uh, is about $24,500. Um, so there is a commitment uh, to include that within the project. Um, there also is a commitment that at least half of the units um, will be uh, at 80% of AMI or below and the other half 80% or above. Um, and finally, under the city's mandatory inclusionary housing program, uh, at least 25% of the units would be permanently affordable. In terms of commercial uses, again, we see this project as having a robust commercial component that can provide both services and jobs uh, for East Harlem. Uh, that could include approximately 100,000 square feet of retail, which we envision as a balance between locally serving retail and potentially some destination retail, as well as up to 200,000 square feet of office uses um, that could also bring jobs um, to this community. Uh, and finally, another important goal is to improve the pedestrian environment in a kind of a corner of East Harlem that is going to um, see significant uh, both infrastructure and private investment in the coming decades um, and really improving and, and making it easier for uh, people to access the site and move around and through the site. So specifically, the land use actions that are before you as part of the Euler process include a rezoning of the site. Uh, from its current M12 district to a C63 commercial district. This is uh, the same zoning district that is located immediately across 2nd Avenue uh, over the blocks of the MEC project. So what we're proposing to do, do here is just pull that zoning district over and apply it to the bus depot site. Uh, secondly, as I mentioned, a zoning text amendment to apply the MIH program. Uh, thirdly, a city map amendment to demap a portion of 2nd Avenue uh, that is located at the western end of the site. This is currently bus parking. It is not actually part of the 2nd Avenue roadway, so that would be demapped um, and would become part of the project site. And finally, authorization to dispose of city-owned property uh, through a competitive RFP. Uh, finally, just a note on um, some of the more recent work that has been going on really to advance uh, the dream of a memorial and start to really lay out how it can be implemented. Uh, at the request of the task force and the speaker, uh, EDC engaged a consultant, Lord Cultural Resources, who are an international uh, consulting firm who specialize in nonprofit and museum cultural institution planning. Uh, they have been working with and meeting regularly with the task force and the speaker's office and EDC over the last few months. Um, and they are really bringing um, a tremendous amount of expertise and experience uh, about planning for a new cultural organization, uh, and that is really informing uh, the discussions that we're having now. Um, so with that, I'll stop, and we are, of course, uh, here to answer any questions that you have. Um, thank you. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to jump in because I, I, just a couple of questions. And obviously, look, you know, we, there's a lot of negotiation yet to do, mm -hmm. and, and clearly we want to maximize the affordable housing, understanding that this project is going to subsidize um, the memorial, both the outdoor and indoor right space that will be allocated towards um, the museum or, or exhibition space. Just to be, just to clarify, going back to the, like the first slide that you had, there is an understanding, and I'm hope that's going to be clear in the RFP as well, that the full footprint, the full um, area where the old cemetery was, will be 
no development will happen on it, right? And it'll be part of the memo- outside memorial. It'll be the whole area of the cemetery, the outlines of the cemetery. That's right. So exactly. So the, the historical boundary of right. the cemetery will remain unveiled and will become like the boundaries of the future memorial. Perfect. I think like the work that will need to be done uh, as a next technical step is to translate the historical maps that show historic boundaries into the new shape post-grid shape, if you will, of the block to really understand exactly where they're allocated, but absolutely. It's and then how do you so project, since Lord went through this um, process with the community, came mm-hmm. up with these recommendations, mm-hmm. you know, how do you expect that to be fulfilled? Is that going to be uh, put within the RFP that developers have to adhere to certain recommendations? How are you going to ensure that what's been laid out uh, in this report is going to be honored. Yeah, absolutely. So the the goal for the city um, has always been that the project delivers both the memorial, the cultural center that will be attached to it, and the the community facility, um, uh, commercial uses, and housing component. So I think we will look to um, ways in the RFP to have clear language that articulates that those two components of the project need to be delivered at the same time uh, by the project, and then. What, what this process has allowed all of us to do is to have to really advance the idea of the memorial from an idea and a dream to something that has now a clear mission statement, a clear mandate, and particularly audiences that the Real Grand Task Force wants to seek, a better sense of programming and what the cultural space um, ought to be doing for the community and for the Bill Grant Task Force. And so it is absolutely our intention to put all of this work and knowledge in the RFP itself to make sure that um, the responses actually uh, respond to the work and fulfill what we all hope um, the project can fulfill. And I mean, I'm familiar with this process because we, we the, the MEC, we did a similar situation where we did um, kind of set guidelines that had to be within the RFP um, and we had followed the Euler process even before uh, a yeah. developer was designated. So I've, right. I've been through this, and the community's been through this before, but we're going to have very clear expectations, right. and we want certain definitions, right? right. Expectations in the language of the RFP right. that we're going to hold developers accountable to in terms of when they respond. And I know we've been going back and forth with you all a little bit on the issue of the affordability and the AMIs and trying to get more clarity on that stuff. Um, and and you have been a little bit resistant. I see what you have here about mm-hmm. the fifty percent at eighty percent or below, and thirty percent will be twenty mm-hmm. percent will be thirty percent of AMI. But I think we, we're probably going to have a little bit more back and forth on that area, just to be clear, because yeah, we don't want that to be too amorphous or mm-hmm. too undefined. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then the last question is is to talk a little bit about the issue of the local hiring, mm-hmm. uh, both on the construction and non construction side, in terms of how do you envision that. Uh, And then I know we've had conversations on the pedestrian safety. You do mention it in your presentation, Mm -hmm. but does the city plan to invest in some of those pedestrian improvements because there seems to be some hesitation towards that. So if you can maybe talk a little bit about those two things. Sure. So on local hiring, the project will have to abide by two important policy programs. The first one is from HPD, which is the targeted hiring outreach plan, and the second one is from EDC, which is hiring NYC that – uh, that is applicable to both construction and permanent job. And so it, it, it will force the developer um, to have a r- really robust outreach plan to make sure that East Harlem residents have an opportunity to apply to jobs and know that they are actually happening. And higher NYC has very specific percentage and <coughs> guidelines to make sure that these residents not only know about the jobs, have the opportunity and equal opportunity to um, to apply and then when they're hired that they have opportunity to be promoted and, and kept over a long time for the project. So it's absolutely our goal and central to the project that that, that be um, that, that be fulfilled. Um, on the on the pedestrian um, safety uh, there's been a lot of conversation with the Barrel Grant Task Force and others on making sure that the memorial is uh, one that is seen, that people actually like know that it's there, that they can kind of walk to it. Um, so that, that will be something that we really look to at the design of the site and the project itself is the relationship between the memorial and the development. Um, today our block is fairly isolated from the East Harlem community and has been um, for decades in great part because it used to be a bus depot and also because of its location. Um, But that will not be its future, in part because of the (laughs) project that will be on it, but also because we have MEC that will come across the street. 
Um, the, uh, there are plans for an espl a waterfront esplanade surrounding our site. Um, so the, our site will get stitched back into the East Harlem community over time. Um, in order to make the project successful, we need to make sure that it is indeed stitched in the community and not completely isolated, mm -hmm. like across, you know, um, Second Avenue. So we will look to kind of pedestrian safety design overall um, when the uh, when we actually are in the RFP process. Once we have a better sense of how the context surrounding us has changed, which is happening month. I mean, and I, I really hope that the city services looks at the, because it is about the MEC, but there's also the Proton Center, which that's is right, being that's built. Right, exactly. And will be online probably sooner than we know. That's and right. a lot of activity that is projected. Yeah. So as we plan, right, planning and yeah. looking forward, yeah. Yeah. that has to be, be, be part of it and not something that is kind of overlooked. And yeah. I know that that's something that um, we, we really feel um, needs to be, uh, commitments that need to be made sooner rather than later. Yeah. So. Uh, those were primarily my questions. I, I want to just say that I, I do appreciate um, EDC in this process. At the beginning, it was not easy, I'm going to be honest. Uh, there was a lot, a lot of uh, skepticism about what the intentions and the vision that the task force had, um, and it was a lot of hard work, all of it volunteer. I mean, these are committed volunteers that have expertise, background, and, and reached out to people and really had a vision about memorializing um, a space that uh, was sacred, really. And in light of talking right now, the, where we find ourselves, it's, it's really a fascinating moment where we find ourselves talking about removing statues and monuments uh, that really talk about a, a horrible aspect of our history and slavery, et cetera, that this conversation has been happening about how do we erect, right? How do we put something up that actually pays homage and tribute uh, to those that their lives were lost because of slavery, right, and, and the conditions. So th this is a really interesting moment, and so I want to just personally thank the task force members because they have been uh, just, uh, you know, just incredible, incredible in terms of their level of, of honor and, and, and love and commitment to this project, and it's uh, been very inspiring for me all this time. So thank you for your efforts in, in finally acknowledging that and really embracing it, and I think the partnership that has developed has been really a wonderful partnership, and, and I appreciate uh, your openness to it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Any questions from members of the committee? No. Um, I have a question, um, but I know someone from the task force is going to speak, um, so I I'll ask, and if not, we can defer it. Um, the operating cost of the memorial, do we know what that's going to be, and, uh, and also the operating cost for the Culture Education Center? Sure, um, I'll, I'll try it on because I'm not sure the, uh, the task, I think the task force, uh, Sharon, will be able to speak okay. greatly about like the vision and mission of what the memorial will be. I think part of what Lord um, Cultural Resources has been doing is first understanding what is this memorial, who is it supposed to serve, uh, and then they did also a lot of um, market analysis, if you will, of like how does a cultural institution in New York City become uh, successful, Has it, how does it attract people, um, what type of uh, audience the memorial would try to seek that may be different than other cultural institution in New York City, to try to really help the Bail Grand Task Force think through um, the different aspects of the memorial and be, like to give you a sense of what that looks like. For example, do you want a, a cultural center that is mainly a museum or that is mainly a community center and there are different like uh, approaches to programming um, to this cultural center attached to the memorial and so th the work that Lord did was mainly to try to advance that um, in correlation with um, with defining programming they looked at what is a standard operating budget for cultural centers around New York City and so there are very wide ranges depending on how large the cultural center is what's in it um, and uh, and is it like a heavy uh, operation or a very light? Can I just, yeah, just yeah. jump in? So, so in in factoring that obviously the project is going to subsidize the outdoor memorial and mm -hmm. the indoor memorial. What mm -hmm. cost are you attaching to it? We I just get to the heart of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 
I don't, I don't want to give a number because I don't think we have a number yet. What we know, as you just said, is that there needs to be a very fine balance between the affordable housing parameters and, uh, uh, and, and the need for like market rate and the cost of the uh, operation of the memorial. And so I think like the language in the RFP and our absolute intent is to make sure that we do not do more uh, market rate unit than necessary to exactly. tie back to uh, the operating cost of the memorial. What those two numbers are is still like very much in flux, uh, depending on the size of the memorial and the program that will be in the memorial. But that is the, no, the, the tight relationship, the financial relationship that needs to happen on the site needs to be very, there needs to be a very tight framework around it so that there's a clear relationship between market rate unit and the fact that they're subsidizing the operating cost of the memorial. And then finally, has an organization been, been identified that will run this memorial in the Cultural Education Center? Is it the task force? So we look to the task force as like the um, historic and um, kind of spiritual and operational uh, body that needs to answer that question, if you will. I think like, um, I think Sharon can discuss what their intentions are. I think we look to them to guide that process. As part of the work that Lord Cultural Resources did, they, um, uh, they canvassed uh, the city and the nation, if you will, about, like with potential organizations that could partner with the Bell Grand Task Force in moving forward. But I think we really look to the task force to help decide how they want to move forward, and we'll take our cues from them. Thank you. Any more questions for EDC? No? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So we have uh, two more speakers. Uh, we have Ms. Sharon Wilkins and also uh, Eric Bilal. How are you? Fine, thank you. Okay, your name? Your Sharon Wilkins. Okay. I'm a registered, a state registered public historian, and I currently serve as the deputy borough historian for Manhattan. And I'm co chair of history and a member of the executive committee for the Harlem African Burial Ground Task Force. Okay, awesome. So, do you have a statement? You have a statement. Yes, I do. All right, awesome. Um, just to address your question very briefly. Uh, the task force does plan to set up a charitable organization, a 501c3 organization. So um, we are going to be working to do that. Um, some of what EDC has indicated to you, I will repeat, but it is worth repeating. Um, I won't go into a lot of historical discussion because we could be here all afternoon. Our hope is that at a later date, uh, we can bring the storyboards to the council and um, give you the breadth and depth of that discussion. For almost a decade, the Harlem African Burial Ground Task Force, a group of professional volunteers with wide-ranging expertise, have engaged in a multidisciplinary, collaborative, and strategic process that involves dialogue and partnerships with local residents, Community Board 11, the 126th Street uh, Bus Depot Task Force, New York City Economic Development Corporation, the MTA, New York City DOT, other government entities, archaeologists and other experts, and most recently, Lord Cultural Resources, a professional organization dedicated to promoting visionary, culturally-based programming uh, worldwide. These important and dedicated efforts, centering around information gathering, research and interpretation, scholarship, community engagement, and institutional fact-finding are focused on rediscovering and sharing facts and information pertinent to over 350 years of United States history, and more specifically, the history of Harlem and New York City. This rich history, largely unknown, involves the histories of indigenous people, the area's first inhabitants, and architects of a fishing village and probably a trading post, and black Americans, free and enslaved, whose knowledge, skill, and craftsmanship 
were crucial to building the infrastructure, culture, and society of this entire nation. Without knowledge about and recognition of the contributions of black America, there can be no authentic record of American history. Through aesthetically attractive design, ongoing research and scholarship, and visionary programming, the Harlem African Burial Ground Task Force desires to remember and honor free and enslaved Africans, New York's colony builders, and connect their stories and life experiences to issues affecting modern day 21st century life in Harlem, New York, and the nation. Furthermore, the intent of the Memorial and Cultural Center is to reverse the neglect and desecration of the sacred space known as the Harlem African Burial Ground, honor the lives and contributions of those interred there, bring diverse audiences together in the hope that they may find resources, information, and solutions to continued local, national, and global struggles for economic and social justice, <coughs> offer educational experiences, research forums, exhibitions, conferences, creative expressions, and other events and activities that will educate, enlighten, inspire, and spiritually uplift all visitors. This is a place for everyone. And also generate increased interest in East Harlem as a rich, historical, social, and economically viable destination for local residents, national, and international visitors. Recognition for this project has been received in many ways. The designation by CB11 as the spokes agency for the Harlem African Burial Ground. Uh, a MAC award as a partnership for archaeology and public engagement, listing and participation in the ongoing Dutch mapping project, an initiative comprised of historians, genealogists, and scholars from the Netherlands and other European countries, and state and national historic registers designation is pending. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? The former, the former history teacher in me has to say thank you for your outstanding work and service. Uh, that was an excellent, excellent presentation. And just one quick question about, uh, and this also might pertain to EDC as well, but I, I'd like for you to answer it because I think it, your answer is very important to me. How do we ensure that this is permanent, sustainable? Because many times these projects have a duration or a period where after 30 years, the affordability might expire or have to be renewed and whatnot. How do we ensure that this project will never ever uh, negatively or, uh, or have an expiration date as far as supporting this important memorial? Has that been discussed? It is being discussed, and I think that largely will be um, the advantage and benefit of having professionals create an organization that has that as its goal. Uh, also, archiving and uh, information that and history that's currently available and continuing to do ongoing research and scholarship, bringing scholars in to help us make sure that um, we have the benefit of, of uh, all the available information and data doing um, constant outreach to schools, universities, and other public entities, making sure that this education and the knowledge is shared and disseminated, um, and creating you know, a great repository. Uh, right, and, and, and also just making sure that, let's say that the project has a, the affordability after 20 years, I'm not even sure what the, uh, the, the duration is. Sometimes these projects have an expiration date as far as how many years affordability will these units have? 20, 30 years, I'm not sure. Uh, but making sure that the support for the memorial from the developers, from the people who are building this, mm -hmm. that that is forever. That's really well, key. That's, that's part of, uh, as uh, the speaker very uh, well said, that's part of the ongoing dialogue and, and negotiation. And, and I want to credit the speaker. She is the co-chair of the task force, uh, and uh, for your really outstanding leadership and work in preserving and making sure that uh, the legacy and the history and education uh, will, will last with us for generations to come. So thank, thank you both for your great work. Thank you. I just want to say thank you all. You, know, you all know we love you. And um, although I personally don't, can't sit at every meeting, but Melinda obviously is there. And, and our partnership is never wavering. And 
you guys have been incredible and you're volunteers and you don't get paid for this but your commitment to preserving this has is, is been really um, stellar so I've been very inspired by your efforts thank you thank you it's mutual <laughs> thank you Ms. Wilkins uh, so we have two more uh, speakers I don't know if they're here Mr. Eric Bilal yes Good afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry, Adam. and you're going to read a statement, right, for yes, Community right. Board 11? Uh, that's right, on behalf of Diane Collier. Okay. Go ahead. My name is Diane Collier, and I am the chair of Community Board 11 Manhattan. I am unable to attend this afternoon. Uh, I am submitting this written statement to support the 126th Street Bus Depot project. The 126th Street Bus Depot project has plenty of goals and just as many uncertainties. No developer, no proposed layout, no plans of zoning uses, no financials with RFP issued after ULERP uh, completed, after the ULERP is completed. CB11 members had initially voiced concerns working on a project and giving approval to a, in quotations, cart before the horse application. But as you have heard so eloquently from the Harlem African Burial Ground Task Force, the village of Harlem, often synonymous with Central Harlem, began right here in East Harlem. The fact that CB11 and I, as a black woman from East Harlem, are very proud of. In addition, we also learned that a community of color and their stories that were disturbed and forgotten over 300 years was confirmed at this sacred land, which now CB11 will make a recommendation for new uses in the 21st century. Yes, there were voices to preserve as parkland, and in a perfect world, the entire site should be sacred, but we don't live in a perfect world. So the task for CB11 was to work through the unknowns for a solution memorializing the site of forgotten souls while addressing community concerns of today, uh, including affordable housing, economic opportunities to close the income gap for our residents. CB11 stepped up to the challenge, uh, expanded scoping comments, stated our intent, board members joined the task force, numerous presentations uh, and agenda item discussions at every committee until final vote. At a late full board April meeting, CB11 voted yes, 27 in favor, three opposed uh, slash abstain, with conditions based on our and East Harlem neighborhood plans, core values of 100% affordability, local hiring, mixed economic development use, um, and two essential provisions critical to our decision were ensuring that the project honors, protects, and sustains the sanctity and cultural history of the Harlem African burial ground at this site and that CB11 remains and has an official and meaningful role throughout the RFP process, final design, and implementation thereof. I ask for your support of this application as a recommendation by CB11. As I said at the CPC public hearing, I again would like to thank and recognize Reverend Singletary, Sharon, Jeannie, and Tom for your perseverance uh, to the cause of over 10 years. Uh, Manhattan Borough President and EDC for continual engagement with the community. And thank you, Madam Speaker, for your commitment to the task force and providing funds for the archaeological study to confirm they were and are here. Submitted, Diane Collier, Chair, Community Board 11, East Harlem. All right, thank you. Any questions from members of the committee? No? Uh, are there any more members of the public who wish to testify? All right, seeing none, I will now close public hearing LU 733, 734, 735, and 736. Thank you. The next item is uh, LU 728, the Polyclinic Apartments application. This application is for a tax exemption pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. This approval will facilitate the rehabilitation and preservation of a fully occupied 151-unit Section 8 development targeted to households at 50% or below AMI. The development is located in Councilmember Johnson's district in Manhattan. I am now opening up the public hearing on LU 728, the Polyclinic Apartments, Article 11, Tax Exemption Application. And uh, if the speakers can please introduce themselves. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jordan Press. I'm Executive Director for Planning and Development, HPD's Government Affairs Unit. And hi, I'm Joe Lynch. I'm counsel for the borrower. Uh, land use number 728 consists of an exemption area containing a 10-story multiple dwelling known as Polyclinic Apartments, located at 341 to 363 West 50th Street in Manhattan Council District 3. Polyclinic 
Apartments is a Section 8 low-income HUD multifamily development currently owned by an Article 5 housing redevelopment company that was approved for disposition on April 26, 1979 by the Board of Estimate. The building is fully occupied and contains 151 units of rental housing with a mixture of unit types including studios, one, two, and three bedroom apartments as well as a superintendent's unit. The household incomes at initial occupancy cannot exceed 50% of AMI and tenants pay no more than 30% of their income toward rent. The sponsor has been actively engaging in repairs and is removing the sole housing code violation. The current owner will convey the property to a new owner who is committed to continued long-term affordability for the occupants of the property. Therefore, the sponsor is seeking to voluntarily dissolve their status as an Article 5 redevelopment housing company and convert to an Article 11 HDFC requiring the sponsor to enter into a regulatory agreement restricting the use of development to low-income rental housing. They will also enter into a new HAP contract for 20 years and a subsequent 20-year contract that will be implemented so that tenant protections will be in place throughout the entire regulatory time frame. In order to help preserve affordability of the low-income units, HPD is before the planning subcommittee seeking approval for the housing company to dissolve their status as an Article 5 terminate their current tax exemption and enter into a new partial Article 11 tax exemption for a period of 35 years that will coincide with the term of the regulatory agreement. Councilman, Council Member Johnson has been briefed and has indicated his support. Thank you. Do you have a statement? Um, not at this time. No. All right. Uh, do we have any questions from members of the committee? No? All right. I am now opening up. Um, are there any members of the public who wish to testify? So we have Mr. Uh, Lee, Lee. I'm sorry, yeah. John Lee and uh, Scott Alter. Yeah, they here. You wish to come up and make a statement? No, we're the, we're the party responsible. All right. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? All right. Seeing none, I will now close public hearings LU seven to eight. The third item is LU 737 and uh, the 1618 Fulton Street application. HBD 6 designation and disposition and project approval of an urban development action area for the proposed redevelopment of city owned property at 1618 Fulton Street in Councilmember Carnegie's district in Brooklyn. As part of the project, three city owned lots will be merged with five privately owned lots to assemble a 15,177 square foot development site. The planned development will be 11 stories tall and include 103 residential units, 100% of which will be affordable on the HPD's N2 term sheets, ranging from 60% AMI to 130% AMI. In addition, there will be 13,236 square feet of ground floor commercial space. I am now opening up the public hearing on LU 737, the 1618 Fulton Street application. If the speakers can please introduce themselves. Uh, good afternoon. Once again, my name is Jordan Press. I'm Executive Director for Development and Planning at HPD's Government Affairs Unit. I'm joined by Juan Barahona from SMJ Development. Um, land use number 737 consists of a ULERP application for the Urban Development Action Area designation, project approval, and disposition of city-owned parcels in connection with the project known as 1618 Fulton Street located at 1616, 1618, and 1624 Fulton Street and 20R Troy Avenue in Brooklyn Council District number 36. Land use number 737 is made up of a vacant city-owned lots within the Fulton Park Urban Renewal Area. The city-owned lots were previously approved for disposition as part of the second amended Fulton Park Urban Renewal Plan on November 6, 2003 as new construction. However, the sites were never developed as planned and the sites remain city owned. Currently, HPD proposes to convey the sites to a sponsor that will help develop the properties under the M squared program, which was created to provide for the new construction of multifamily buildings with a range of affordability. The sponsor for 1618 Fulton Street plans to combine the public sites with an adjacent privately owned sites at block 1699, lots 33, 34, 36, 38, and 137 to create an assemblage in order to construct one 11-story building, the total of 102 rental dwelling units plus one unit for a superintendent, and approximately 13,100 square feet of commercial or community facility space. There will be a mixture of unit types, including studio, one, and two-bedroom apartments. 
All units will be affordable under an HPD regulatory agreement. Additionally, 20% of the units will be permanently affordable under the Voluntary Inclusionary Housing Program. Estimated uh, rents range from 57% of AMI to 130% of AMI, with targeted household incomes between 60 and 130% of AMI. The building will incorporate green features that will, that will meet enterprise green community criteria. Residential amenities for this project include an exercise room and children's playroom, laundry rooms on all residential floors, and a rooftop patio for use by all building tenants. Um, no tenant use has been determined at this time for the community facility commercial space, although I know the developer has had conversations with the council member uh, on this matter and can speak to it. Um, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Hey, good afternoon, council members. My name is Juan Barahona from SMJ. I'm here to, honestly, at this point, really answer any questions you might have on the project. I think Jordan, you know, really summarized the entirety of the project, uh, you know, much better than I could at this point. Um, you know, but overall, I, you know, I, I'd like to kind of just emphasize that this has been about a year and a half long effort to uh, to make uh, a site really out of, you know, uh, out, out of nothing. Um, acquiring three uh, city-owned, I'm sorry, acquiring five privately owned sites and assembling them with three city-owned sites to make a much better uh, project overall. So that's, you know, that's, uh, that's, the, that's in a nutshell for me, but I'd like to, you know, really open it up to questions if you have any. Any questions, members of the committee? I have a few questions. Sure. Um, this is city-owned land, and I'm seeing that there's a large percentage of your units that are at 130% AMI. Correct. Um, what's the average median income in that in that district? In in District uh, 35, uh, you know the AMI. I couldn't speak to the to, to the district the AMI in the district per se. Um, the rents are well below the market there, right? Yes, but these rents are you know generally below market. The and it, just to clarify one piece of it, it's it's three city owned lots and five privately owned lots. It's it's three city owned lots combined with five privately owned lots, and the reason you have the program that you have with basically a, half of the project at one thirty percent AMI is to account for the acquisition prices for the privately, private, you know, privately acquired parcels. Um, that was really the only kind of the only mechanism that would work uh, to acquire the parcels and combine them with the city-owned parcels. And Overall, we've got about a 50-50 split. Right, and, and there's going to be a 50% community preference for this project, correct? That's correct. Um, I see here in the letter that you submitted with your plans that you're going to focus on minority women-owned businesses. Correct. All right. How can you reassure the council? Uh, one of the main concerns that I'm hearing, at least in the South Bronx, and, I, and I'll hand this off to, to council, my colleague here, is that the administration or the city is saying, hey, we're giving X amount of dollars to minority women-owned businesses, but in reality, they're not going to, the majority of these dollars or projects or contracts are not going to minority women. To minority women. Yes, okay. you know, women of color. Mm -hmm. How can you assure me that this this project will not just focus on minorities, but minority women-owned businesses, women of color? Understood. I, you know, I think as you probably know, within the past couple of years, you know, there's been a movement um, initially at HPD to not only diversify the sponsors that are building the affordable housing, but also you know the contractors that are you know participating in that. Um, you know. I guess I'm probably the one of the examples of that, you know. So I got to this point by virtue of, you know, getting my business certified at SBS uh, to be one of the few probably Latino sponsors that you'll, you know, you'll see, unfortunately, unfortunately for whatever, you know, uh, for affordable housing. Um, and so I think, you know, to answer your question, and I, I guess the, the best way that I know possible is really to drill down on finding the best qualified and uh, you know, M M MWBE sponsors, I think, has to come out of desire internally from, you know, making that making that best effort. You know, I could sit up here. Well, I think most sponsors will sit up here and yes you to death, but I, you know, I will commit to to seeking out uh, minority and minority women, uh, you know, uh, enterprises to participate in this project to kind of diversify the pool. I'm not kind of satisfied with it just ending at me, so to speak. Um, you know, and I've made that commitment to the council member as well, 
to really hone in on what, who are the people that can benefit the most from these massive uh, city-sponsored public-private partnerships, right, where there's a lot of dollars um, and a lot of, economic, a lot of economic activity happening, but it's not all flowing to the places uh, you know, that are create, that, that to communities that need to really be creating more wealth. Um, you know, so that's, I mean, that's, you know, I don't really have specifics, honestly, at this point. Um, I can tell you that, for example, the, uh, although the, the firm isn't uh, a woman of, a, you know, woman of color owned, the architect of record is, is, a, is a WBE. And, and that was a conscious effort on my part to seek out, uh, you know, on the professional side, as well as the contracting side, more minorities and women professionals to participate in, in, the, in, this, in, this, in this business. Um, you know, so that's, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, and all I can tell you is that I, I, I'm committing to it, you know, via the letter and, and, other, and other, uh, um, other mechanisms with HPD, um, you know, but that's kind of, that's how I right. answer your Thank question. You. Uh, I'm going to hand it off, but Jordan, um, you know, I, all future projects, just know that this is going to be another one of my questions and standards is how are these developers going to bring in contractors of minority women? Um, and, and, and that's 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 something that I'm hearing a lot as I'm meeting uh, with residents in the community and I'm meeting with uh, minority women owned businesses that are saying, hey, I'm not getting my fair share in these contracts. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Council Member Carnegie. Uh, thank you, Chair Salamanca. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about this this particular project, right? Because it's in my district and and we're, we're uh, I feel like I'm the epicenter of gentrification. And when we can provide affordable housing uh, in a district like mine, it's, it's awesome. But the second phase of it was to commit from your company, SMJ, to do affordable commercial spaces, which I think is a very unique opportunity where in the ULERT process, we can get developers to commit to not only affordable housing, but affordable commercial spaces. Because right now, you know, in the city on the back end, it's almost impossible to find a lease that suits a mom and pop anywhere in the city of New York. So the willingness to do this up front, I think, is setting a precedent that I'd like to see replicated continually. So the idea that you were willing to take a, a sizable footprint on the commercial side and break it down is a model that I think we can use to protect the sanctity of uh, mom and pop small businesses that provide essential services. Mm -hmm. So in my district, I'm losing my shoemaker, uh, the cleaners, uh, things that have been essential to the quality of life for residents in the community who have to now go two or three districts over potentially to get those essential services. So I, I, I have to, you know, thank you for this commitment and your willingness to work not only with my office but with the community board because it's really a joint effort to get where we want to ultimately be with this, right? So the, the initial commitment uh, was, was, was fine. But the fact that you drilled down a little bit deeper to say what the stakeholders and partners would be to see this through to fruition, which is the community board and the bid, you know, and the merchants associations in the area to make sure that you can provide, um, that you can find good qualified small mom and pops and MWBEs in our local community. So your commitment to local sourcing for small businesses is essential to the vibrancy of, of communities, uh, particularly uh, Bedford Stuyvesant and Crown Heights. So again, I just I just think that it's a replicable model. I think if we do this correctly, uh, with your initial commitment and the breakdown and the partnerships, we will have good, sustainable small businesses that you know continue to That's stay right. in our communities while we have affordable housing. Because I I think you know I'm not a <laughs> I'm not a city mm -hmm. planner, but I think having one without the other is a recipe for disaster. So even where we have like in East New York and Brownsville good quality affordable housing, but they don't have the services to match. So to be able to think through this at this particular juncture gives us a balance that I think I can live with in my community and communities like uh, 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 Council Member Salamanca who, ha who characteristically have not had the services match and have not had a, a keen eye out for small minority owned businesses. I, I just think this is the right way to go. And I'd like to thank you for that commitment uh, from your company. You're welcome, Council Member. All right. I just want to just kind of follow up on, on that piece of it. You know, um, you know, in the R7D zoning here that requires the retail presents you know, challenges, but also opportunities, I think. And I think, you know, uh, if we start early on with your office and, and, and the board, 
and the bid, I think we could, you know, it, it just requires a little more effort to get to, get to where, you, where we want to be. And I think to create really more, because I think at the end of the day, it's, you know, it, it, the housing creates the stable living environment, but the, uh, but the, the retail uh, opportunities will create the, the wealth back into the community that will, you know, will, will, you know, will have a, a, a multiplier effect, I think, ultimately. But, I mean, also yeah. the idea that you w were willing to be in on uh, this retail diversity piece because with, with this project, we have a chance to not only just put mom and pops, but put essential services in, which is really about retail diversity. Mm -hmm. So when we look at some of the successful communities in Brooklyn, at least, like uh, a Fifth Avenue, it seemed so well planned out that you could spend, because for me, the ability to spend your entire afternoon on a particular thoroughfare uh, uh, kind of generates the revenue necessary for those businesses to, to exist. Yeah. And, and we don't necessarily have that retail diversity in, in, in parts of central Brooklyn, uh, primarily in Bedford Stuyvesant and Crown Heights. So, it, so it's a bunch of one offs as we sit here. So either you're going to get your hair done or, or, or you know, or go into the liquor store or something. Uh, but to have a, a consistent flow of retail diversity is quintessential for uh, the vibrancy of a community and to find all of the components of that community ever present through its, through its businesses. So it's, this, this process is, is, is not an easy process, and I, and, I, and I understand that, for us to get where we need to be, but your early on commitment plus the commitment from the other stakeholders that were mentioned, I think can get us where we need to be and be a rec replicable model again uh, for communities like mine across the city. Absolutely. All right. Um, any other questions? No? All right, well, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. We also have uh, a Mark Gordon. Okay, you don't understand? All right. Um, are there any more members of the public who wish to testify? All right, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on LU 737. We will now vote on LU's 728 and 737, which have the support of the local council members, LU 733, 734, 735, 736, 738, and 742 will be laid over. Uh, council, please call the, the roll on a vote to approve. Chair Salamanca. Aye. Council Member Cohen. Oh, yes. Why, thank you. Um, I know Councilmember Johnson's not here, but I got to tell you, Polyclinic, I think that's a terrible name. Can't we do something about that? Uh, I don't know if people want to live in Polyclinic apartments. But if Councilmember Johnson says it's okay, I guess it's okay with me and I'm going to vote aye. Councilmember Traeger. Aye. Uh, by a vote of three in, three in the affirmative, zero negatives, and no abstentions, the land use items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. Yeah. All right. And so, um, we're going to leave the roll open for 15 minutes. All right, thank you.